While Isaac Asimov received a Hugo declaring his Foundation trilogy the best all-time series, there's nothing he would be more associated with than robots. Asimov approached the idea of robots, which were always rising up against their masters in other fiction, from a sense of logic. People are going to be afraid of their creations. People are going to be prejudiced, small-minded, and foolish, like they often are as they adapt to new things. While some might be foolhardy enough not to do this, Asimov felt those stories were done to death, with the same stated or unstated message that humanity was paying for its hubris. He wanted to do something else, and was inspired to pursue the idea of a misunderstood robot based upon a story called I, Robot. The story that Asimov wrote, Robbie, was the first step in creating his famous Three Laws of Robotics, that a robot can't injure a human, or through an action, allow a human to come to harm, a robot has to obey human orders, a robot must protect its own existence, and each can't contradict the law before it. The idea of these safeguards to protect us from our own creations was actually unstated for a time, until the story Runaround presented them by showing how each was influencing a robot's behavior. That his stories predated the established rules shows that they were more of a formality to Asimov, that by and large our creations would generally be good by nature, although with some exceptions. The many short stories were gathered together with linking material to form the book called appropriately, I, Robot. That was in 1950. Three years later, Asimov released this, his first full-length novel about robots. While the tales from I, Robot were about people who work with robots, usually Susan Calvin, the robo-psychologist, getting involved in the problems was more of a technical matter. These were people who, by and large, chose to work around robots, and thus, while there might be occasional misgivings, they accepted them. Caves of Steel, on the other hand, was about a society where robots were unwelcome, and the human protagonists felt the same. It was a different dynamic completely here. And yet, just like the majority of the tales from iRobot that were about puzzles and mysteries to be sorted out, the Caves of Steel is a mystery. A detective story in a literal sense, as it is focused on the actions of plainclothesman Elijah Bailey of the New York Police Department. The thing about Asimov's approach to writing is that oftentimes it's very centered on ideas. That's not to say his work is dry or that his characters are cardboard. It just means that at the center of his work are the ideas and everything bends around them rather than things like character or mood or theme being at the center. It's not that world building is rich so much as Asimov likes to take an idea and explore its meaning and then bang the ideas together and see what emerges. So the situation of the book, which would serve as the overall background to the robot series as it was later called, is about the contrast between two factions of humanity, those living on Earth and those living in space. Appropriately, the sides are the Earthers and the Spacers. The Spacers left Earth long ago and with the help of robots created their own personal Edens, where they were able to tackle and overcome the problems of Earth, such as limited lifespans and diseases. And back on Earth, the focus was on tending to its overwhelming population problem. Eight billion people, far too much for the Earth to support without radical social transformation. And yes, we passed 7.5 billion in April of 2017, and the majority of complaints about the human race right now is that they're too damn fat, not that they're starving to death. But still, Asimov considered a world where, with triple the population of the world that he knew, well, it was something untenable unless there was a serious change. So he conceived of gigantic cities contained in metallic domes housing massive populations. Everybody lived in cities now. Nobody lived out in the country anymore. Nobody lived in the suburbs. Cities were now so huge that, in fact, people lived their entire lives inside these caves of steel. A kind of merit-based socialism is now in place. There is some money, but generally, everything is centrally controlled and approved by a bureaucracy. Whether or not you have a large or a small apartment, whether you're allowed to have a kitchen or a wash basin, what perks you have in the communal cafeterias, everything like that. This was determined by your rating, with those higher up getting more perks and those at the bottom, the declassified, getting next to none. The declassified are those without a job, 
and thus those who are not contributing. The world of Elijah Bailey is one where a strong sense of community and a diminished need for privacy is a given. Given that, it's natural that robots would be resented by the overwhelming majority of the population. A robot does the work of a person, ergo, that's one more person without a job. For every robot that's walking around, there's some poor schmuck somewhere subsisting on yeast paste and abject poverty. The spacers, on the other hand, had unlimited space for expansion and a very limited population. Unlike those back home, they didn't have to worry about the great unwashed milling about without work. Robots would see to it that all necessary work was done so that those humans could find a way to do something else. Their administrators didn't need to worry about ensuring that millions don't die to starvation every day. Their scientists didn't need to fixate on the most efficient way to do urban planning or resource collection or agriculture. Like the educated of Laputa in Gulliver's Travels, the spacers have their servants to handle day-to-day -day problems while they can think about other things. It's thus no surprise that the spacers one day arrive over Earth with weaponry that the Earthers can't hope to match and start issuing demands. Not to worry, it's not that they're to be given tribute or anything like that, but there is a new area built adjacent to New York City, a place called Space Town, where the spacers are in charge. And this is the place where the murder takes place, and the victim is a spacer. So there's only about 8 billion people with a motive, plus any spacers who didn't like the guy. In the novel, Police Commissioner Julius Enerby assigns the murder case to Bailey, who is already unhappy that he's investigating a murder in Spacetown, where he'll be stuck dealing with those arrogant spacers. But what makes it worse is that one of them is going to be his partner on this case. And to make it the worst day of his life, that spacer is none other than R. Daniil Oliva, and the R stands for Robot. The conflict between Daniil's robotic nature and Bailey's earther nature plays a significant part, and thus makes Caves of Steel an early example of the buddy cop story. To help with his job, Daniil is the first completely human-looking robot. He can even imitate the act of eating, and he's anatomically correct. And yet, as an Asimov robot, he is programmed with the three laws and must obey them no matter the situation. They get their first glimpse of anti-robot resentment at a shoe store where a near riot breaks out because three have been hired to work tending customers. Bailey is content to wait for backup, but Daniil threatens to use his blaster on the crowd if they don't disperse, and they don't call his bluff. Daniil insists that it was a bluff, but the mere act was so shocking it begins to fill Bailey with doubts. That night, after Daniil slips out to use the personal, that's the communal public bathroom, it clinches it for Bailey. The man who was murdered was not only a spacer, but Daniil's creator, along with Dr. Fastolf, who seems to be in charge of Spacetown. He was shot in the chest by a blaster, and yet the weapon was never found, and everyone in Spacetown had their minds scanned to reveal that they did not have in, in their nature to be a killer, including the visiting commissioner who was very distraught at the situation. Therefore, they reason, it had to be an Earther who did it. And since no Earther entered Spacetown through the city, they reasoned that he had to run across the open fields that surround the city and enter through an unguarded side passage. Except Bailey knows that that's ridiculous. After generations of living in cities, no one can stomach going outside anymore. Even the most fervent medievalist, as those resistant to this modern society call themselves, even they can't do it. Far more likely, Bailey says, and accuses fast off of this to his face, is that there was no murder. The victim was actually a robot, and Daniil, who looks exactly like his creator, is in fact the human, as evidenced by his behavior. Only Daniil disproves this by removing his arm to show that he is indeed a robot, and Bailey a great fool. Despite the offense, especially because Bailey accused Fastoff and the spacers of orchestrating this to justify making greater demands of Earth, Fastoff is quite happy with Bailey because of his way of looking at things. He points out that humanity, all of humanity, is in trouble. The Earthers are trapped in a system that is moving closer and closer to inevitable collapse. There's no way out. They can't go on like this indefinitely. But likewise, the Spacers are in trouble too. Their long lives and dependence on robots has led to a stagnation. Eventually, they too are going to face a collapse. 
This would be a common theme throughout Asimov's writings. Things that improve the human condition inevitably lead to a situation where humanity stagnates unless we can find a way to avoid complacency in that. That's the problem that both societies have here, and thus why humanity needs a new solution. The solution, as decided on by Fastoff and those like him, is to encourage Earthers to go out and settle the galaxy once again. This will bleed off their excess population, 80% larger than all the spacer worlds put together, and force them out of their comfort zones. Bailey doubts it at first, but eventually comes around to that way of thinking. Medievalists want to go backwards when they should be moving forwards. The medievalists, incidentally, have been stalking Bailey and Daniil this entire time, unaware that their group was the desired result of the spacers here, who pushed robots onto the community specifically to create an underclass that would be willing to go to the stars because they have nothing left to lose. Individual people are being harmed by this, but in the name of a greater good for humanity. And this is an important theme for the robot series, the needs of the individual balancing against the needs of the many, especially when humanity is at stake. Another theme this establishes is the false solution. This is a spoiler, I know, but one common element throughout this is that the first solution to the mystery is not the correct one. Now, this is common in other works, but in this case, it's the master detective, Bailey, who is the one who is wrong and has to try again to find the right answer. As a scientist, though, it's understandable why this is reasonable to Asimov, because a scientist frequently finds themselves advancing a theory only to discover it's wrong and needing another run at the problem. Along the way, there's conflict between Bailey and his wife, Jessie, who learns that Daniil is a robot and is terrified of the idea of him staying with them. Jessie, I'm sorry to say, is not one of Asimov's better characters. She's weak-willed and callow, lacking any kind of emotional strength. The series does her no favors, maintaining this attitude throughout the rest of the books. She's no help, she's an obstacle. And her mistreatments throughout the series, well, seemed as if they're justified. In fact, she will prove to nearly be the cause of Bailey's downfall in this book. Her true name is actually Jezebel, and the connection to the Bible is intentional and a significant theme of the book. Jessie, in fact, secretly delights in the wicked implications of her name and is outraged when Bailey argues that, in fact, Jezebel's mostly the victim of bad press in a book written by her enemies. When Daniil learns about this, he asks about the Bible, so Bailey tells the story of the adulterous woman whom Jesus saved from being stoned to death and then was sent away with the remark, Go and sin no more. Daniil was created originally to go amongst the humans of this world to learn about them for the spacers, but he was reprogrammed with a sense of justice, defined for him as when the laws are upheld. So the woman being freed in defiance of the law against adultery is puzzling to his literal mind, which cannot fathom any larger meaning of justice. This plays in at the climax when Bailey has finally deduced the true identity of the murderer, because of the three laws, it is impossible for a robot to harm a human. Daniil not only was bluffing, but it was impossible for him not to bluff, because his blaster is a fake. There's no situation where he could ever use one, and plenty of ones where he could accidentally hurt somebody, or have his blaster taken away by a criminal and used to do harm. So, his was just a prop. So, Bailey's second question of whether a robot could have crossed that field is likewise answered. Yes, it could have, but it couldn't have done the deed. By this time, Asimov recognized that the literality of the words of his three laws left room for things to happen, as many of his robot short, short stories showed. So the laws instead serve the foundation for all robotic thought. This is actually the way that some ethical AI researchers believe we should operate, that benevolence is fundamental to our creation's nature, that to do wrong not only is impossible, but literally unthinkable. The words are gone, but the meaning of them, the moral framework of them, that human life is sacred, that robots exist to help them, that their further existence matters, is the most basic part of a robot's thinking. 
This is why, as Bailey is told, there's no way around the loss. They are so fundamental to the known positronic brain after all these centuries of designing robots that to do it without them is to start all over again. The only ones who could pull this off are the spacers, and they wouldn't dare do that because their society exists on the backs of robots. The last thing they would do is create a robot, even as an experiment, who could refuse to obey and back that up with lethal force. Bailey concludes that the answer is what the spacers had been pushing for all along, the so-called C-Fee culture, as in carbon and iron. Humans and robots working together. The commissioner is, in fact, the murderer, having been given the weapon by a robot that ran cross-country to hand it to him so that he could do the deed. Only the commissioner was actually intending to blow away Daniil, as he himself was a medievalist and wanted to put a stop to this experiment. Yes, the robot could have destroyed Daniil because the robot can destroy another robot, but because Daniil looks like a human, that probably would have stopped the robot from carrying through on it, so that's why the commissioner would do it himself. Only, he mixed things around. He shot the wrong person and was horrified that his attempt at destruction of property was instead cold-blooded murder. However, as a result of this investigation, the idea of a new wave of Earthers heading out to the galaxy to settle new worlds has started to stir. And Bailey suggests that, rather than punishing the commissioner for the crime, that instead he uses connections as both a government official and a member of the medievalists to push for this idea of settling to be a reality. The spacers find that satisfactory, and Daniil, seeing that even though it violates his idea of justice by letting a murderer go free, it will result in a far greater good than punishing him would. And he's beginning to understand, and closes by repeating the command, Go and sin no more. And again, this shows the recurring issue in the series, the needs of the one and the needs of the many. The victim is left without justice for what has befallen him, and yet the greater good of humanity is benefited by that act. Although the book, as I said, was heavily focused on ideas, especially of putting together a puzzle and seeing how it works out, a greater strength of the novel is the character dynamic between Bailey and Daniil. Always seen from Bailey's point of view, naturally, but the two have a lot of good interplay, and it's interesting how Bailey seems to grow to like Daniil over the book, and yet to not really trust him. Yet this is justified, because his ultimate salvation and solution to the case are thanks to Daniil, but only because Bailey can appeal to his literalness, not because Daniil has any kind of loyalty to his partner. Daniil, at this stage, has been working mere days after all. He is little beyond what he has been programmed to know to work with. This relationship works well to keep things fresh throughout, and that's why people were delighted to learn that not long after a second novel would be arriving, which we'll look at next month.